Uh, this, this is some work that was motivated more by what was known to cannot tell us correctly, which is what it referred to as mixing or cooling of the mixed layer. So this is a Parada Moran at 4 North 23 West. So the last cruise that we did to service it. Um, so, so they can't measure the mixing directly, but we can estimate it indirectly from the residual in the terms in the heat balance, which we can calculate based on the more measurements. So the idea with this was to look at a combination of different data and combine it with models to try to figure out the seasonal cycle of turbulent cooling in the tropical Atlantic and two locations on the tropical Atlantic. Um, so we combine this with one-dimensional models and we focused on two regions, one in the ITCZ region at 4 North, 23 West, and one at 15 North, 38 West, which is more in the trade wind region where winds are stronger seasonally uh, in the annual mean also, and where um, north of the ITCZ where you don't get the rainfall and more winds of the ITCZ, so two different regimes. Uh, and this is a work I've done with colleagues in Germany, uh, Marcus Stengler, Rebecca Hummels, Ronellis, and Lois here, who's in Brazil. All right. So, very brief outline. I'll talk about why it's important to understand turbulent mixing and cooling of SSP. And some previous results, which are really in the tropical Atlantic, they focus mainly on the equatorial region. So I'll show some previous results based on um, observations in that area, what we know from them. Then I'll talk about, uh, I mentioned an indirect way to estimate the turbulent cooling. So this is based on the Parada Mooring data. So I'll describe a new data set based on the Parada Mooring data that kind of fills in gaps and corrects for biases, which is useful for estimating the residual and the turbulent cooling. Uh, then more direct estimates of the cooling at 15 North, 38 West in the trade wind region. And this is based on measurements from the morning combined with one-dimensional models. So it's a little bit more direct, less indirect than the residual method, but still relying on models. At 4 North 23 West, we actually have direct measurements of currents and the vertical current shear, which are very useful for calculating estimating mixing. And when I was here talk a few months ago, she talked about the top first experiment in which we have 11 current meters and the upper 87 meters. So that's turned out to be very useful for estimating mixing current shear and shear induced mixing at this location. So this is even a more direct method at this location because we actually have the current shear along with all the other mooring measurements, the surface and the temperature salinity in the subsurface. And we find some lot of similarities actually between these two locations despite the fact that they're in very different regimes, and then I'll give some conclusions and remaining uh, questions. So, uh, first, just briefly, um, motivation for why, uh, what, what we want to look at in this study. And the main thing we want to answer is uh, whether there's significant turbulent cooling in the tropical Atlantic off the equator. So, this hasn't really been addressed very much as what's been on the equator, which makes sense because on the equator you have the cold sun development and strong mixing with the undercurrent. And so, so is there strong cooling off the equator? Does it vary seasonally? And we know there's not, we know there's strong current shear on the equator, like I said, in the undercurrent, but off the equator, if there's no undercurrent, if there's no shear, how can mixing be generated, significant mixing and cooling? So that's another uh, question. How does it vary seasonally? And what drives it if there's no mean shear, strong mean shear, as a vertical, um, vertical shear of the currents. And like I said, we use heat budget residuals from the Parada moorings and actual measurements from the moorings combined with one dimensional models. All right, so I said a lot of work's been done on the equator, especially in the eastern tropical Atlantic. So this shows, uh, as background, the shading here is the heat budget residual calculated from satellite data and Argo. And what it shows, so this is an estimate of the turbulent cooling um, from this residual. We can't estimate it, calculate it directly. So it shows, as you might expect, the highest values in the central uh, eastern equatorial mass. 
Sun, and then uh, off the equator, somewhat surprisingly, you have also have strong mean cooling, 40, up to 40 or 50 watts per square meter in the mean at many places off the equator. So on the equator, we, we know that it's uh, some direct measurements actually on the equator microstructure measurements. The white lines here represent cruises in which microstructure measurements were made to calculate turbulence and mixing. From these measurements, uh, we know Hannah uh, al and her paper showed that uh, this can account for this residual here between the change in the mixed air heat storage rate, which is the black, uh, sorry, the green, and the forcing terms that would force these changes in the mixed air heat storage. So if you account for the turbulent mixing, you get the red dots uh, cooling, and you have very good agreement with the actual heat storage at, along the equator. And off the equator, it appears that mixing, at least at this location, is not very important. You get good agreement without including the turbulent cooling. So on the equator, this fits nicely with what we'd expect based on the heat budget residuals and appears to be strong seasonal cooling. The question is what happens when you go off the equator? And in a recent paper uh, that's been submitted, uh, we showed that uh, near inertial waves they actually contribute significantly at this location, the black circle. So that's a possibility, the inertial wave induced mixing. Uh, so in this study, we want to look at two other locations where there are strong mean deep budget residuals where we would expect significant mixing and figure out what's, uh, what's happening, what's driving that cooling at those locations. Um, and in terms of motivation, why we want to understand the mixing, if, you, if you're looking at the South Atlantic and you're looking at a couple of models, you can't really ignore the biases, the problems with the models. And it's difficult to make any kind of uh, predictions or projections on seasonal and longer time scales. It makes it more complicated. So the thinking is that maybe some of these biases are due to. Ah, okay. Okay, hello, testing, is it better?
Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. We're back. All right. Uh, so, uh, a couple of model biases. Um, uh, all right. Good. Uh, all right, so a couple of model biases. You can't really ignore them in the tropical Atlantic, and possibly some of them might be due to problems with mixing parameterizations in the models. That's one motivation for understanding turbulent mixing better to improve the models. Um, so this is the mean, the mean state of the tropical Atlantic, SST, and rainfall and winds. This is in the GSCL CM2.1 model as an example, but it's pretty similar across all models. and we have strong SST biases in the eastern tropical Atlantic, which is associated with wind biases and big rainfall shifts of the ICCZ. And the, so the locations that we picked for this study are kind of in this, the warm bias region in the east in the ICCZ region, and one's in the cold bias region in the tropical North Atlantic at 38 West. Uh, oh, right, right, right. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so these parada parada moorings that I mentioned earlier are useful for understanding uh, diagnosing these biases and understanding the upper ocean and atmospheric processes that uh, contribute to variability in the tropical Atlantic. We have 18 of these moorings which are shown in this figure, and they all measure standard meteorological measurements near the surface and also temperature and salinity at uh, several depths in the subsurface. They've been out there, many of them have been out there since 1997, so we have about 21 years of data for many of them, long records. And the one more in the northeast, southwest, and one in the southeast were deployed more recently, so there's about 12 years or so of data from them. So we have these long records, and they're really good, but they have some um, some complications in using them. There's missing data, and the, the most the more that have the most missing data are in the eastern equatorial Atlantic. Up to 30% of the data there is missing, and this is because the moorings are out there for a year at a time, and they're in you know harsh ocean conditions, and they're not serviced. They're not uh, you know, the instruments can degrade, but the batteries can fail. So you sometimes the failures of the sensors and gaps in the in the records. Um, and vandalism also can happen in the east. So we have these gaps in the records. The vertical resolution of the temperature and salinity sensors are not the best for estimating, calculating things like mixed layer depth. And we have biases in some of the uh, variables like salinity, air temperature, humidity, and solar radiation. So we wanted the idea first was to clean up these records and eliminate any biases and get better vertical resolution of the temperature and salinity from the moorings before we get into calculating the residuals and looking at the vertical cooling, the, the mixing. Um, so this is an example. So I'll go through a few slides that show some examples of the biases from the moorings, the raw data, and how we correct them and make this enhanced parata data set. So based on this, the air temperature and humidity can have biases. And I think most of these are probably caused by something getting stuck in the sensor. Some, you know, some kind of aerosol or some particle gets stuck in there and then it absorbs moisture so it causes the high humidity, high air temperature biases. That's my thinking. And you can see them pretty clearly in, if you just plot SSC versus air temperature, the green line on the top plot, you see pretty clearly there are deployments when the uh, air temperature is higher than SSP for an extended period of time. And this is clearly something wrong with the sensor, so we remove the data, replace it with the seasonal cycle of the mooring data plus anomalies from the ERA interim product. And the same similar thing for relative humidity, there's some biases high for like here you see during 2000 or 1999, you see a high. Uh, bias in humidity for one whole deployment. So the same thing there, we, we remove any questionable data and fill it 
fill the gaps. Uh, there can be biases in salinity, and the best way to find these is to compare salinity at one depth with salinity from an adjacent depth and look for offsets. So what happens mostly here is that you get drifts in the conductivity towards lower values with time. So you lead to low salinity biases, and you can see this clearly here. In 2004, where there's this drift, this is 20 meter minus one meter, the gray curve. So you get a drift uh, towards lower salinity values at 20 meters, for example, here, and also in 2008 into 2009. And there's something strange going on here. Um, so we remove any questionable data and replace it with uh, data from the nearest sensor in depth after correcting for the mean difference in salinity between the depths. And if there's no data, if the mooring, you know, there's absolutely no data for an extended period of time, we use uh, optimum interpolation using Argo data in the nearby region around the mooring and uh, to fill in, fill in the gaps based on what we have from Argo. So that's how we fill salinity, okay, and solar radiation. Uh, there can be biases mostly in the tropical North Atlantic. This is where we have lots of dust coming off of Africa. These dust aerosols are highest in the summer, shown in the top plot. And what this does is it starts to accumulate on the sensor on the shortwave radiation dome, which is a clear uh, glass dome. So let the shortwave in. If you get dust on the dome, the shortwave that you measure starts to go way down, and you get a big bias up to 100 watts per square meter here in 2002 at 12 north, 23, uh, 38 west. And this bias then abruptly disappears if you swap out the sensor and put in a clean one. So we know it's something, we know it's the dust getting on the sensor. And the rainfall is shown as the red, the red asterisk. So if, if this starts to rain, this can also rinse the dome. And then you get a, a more gradual return of the shortwave value to what you'd expect. And this happens here in Middletown in 2006, where rainfall comes. You don't have any sensor swaps, rainfall starts to rinse the dome, and you get values closer to what you'd expect based on climatology. So we came up with a method to correct this. It's basically using clear sky, estimating the clear sky shortwave from the mooring records based on the highest values of shortwave for a given a period, comparing it to a reanalysis clear sky shortwave product. And then the difference gives you the bias, and then you can correct the, the mooring data um, based on that. Bias that you see in the clear sky. Does All right. Rain? What? Rain data? Do you measure? Yeah, we don't use the rain. We ended up not using the rain data in the correction, but the rain just kind of tells you. It just verifies that it is dust on the on the radiometer dome that's being rinsed because it starts to whenever it rains, it starts to, the bias starts to go away. So, but there is rain from the mooring. This is rainfall. The bottom panel shows rainfall measured up the mooring. So it's helpful for that. All right. Finally, temperature, ocean temperature. There aren't any biases in the ocean temperature measurements themselves. But the problem is, like I said, the vertical resolution of the sensors is not the greatest. It's usually 10 or 20 meters. So if you just do simple linear interpolation, it results in big biases in your temperature, the temperature that you uh, interpolate to between the depths. So we we use a method instead that uses Argo profiles around the mooring. So the idea is we get all the Argo profiles around the mooring for a given season based on a certain day uh, from the mooring record that we want to vertically interpolate. And then we subsample the Argo profiles to the vertical resolution of the mooring sensor, of the uh, mooring sensors in the vertical. And we do a regression based on that and then use that regression to fill in the vertical gaps between sensors on the mooring. And this results in much better uh, much better values between the, the mooring sensor depth. So the bias here is shown for the simple linear interpolation in black and using this Argo method is in red and you can see it reduces the biases significantly at these two locations as an example. And it also reduces the RMS error a little bit, not as much. So it's mainly getting rid of these big biases that you introduced by not accounting for the real uh, vertical structure of the temperature with, um, between the sensors. Okay, so with all those things, this shows some of the uh, some of the data from our enhanced Parada product, temperature and salinity at a couple locations. 
And so you can see all the gaps are filled. It's interpolated to a five meter vertical grid. Uh, the black line is mixed layer depth and white line is um, 20 degree isotherm depth. So it seems to be doing pretty well. We get consistent data. And the last thing, so to calculate the heat budget, we need a horizontal direction of heat and we need, so we need ocean current. And at a lot of mooring locations, we don't have velocity measured directly. Um, so we use uh, Rick Lumpkin's Drifter Altimetry Wind product at those locations where we don't have velocity at the mooring. And we also use it to fill in gaps at the locations where we have velocity, but the sensor fails or it's um, not available for some reason. And the final thing is this gives velocity at 10 or 15 meters. What we want is the velocity averaged in the mixed layer. So we, we create a lookup table using an ocean reanalysis that has um, velocity at all depths, usually about five meter resolution, and based on the time of year and the observed mixed layer depth and the velocity at 10 meters, we can use a regression or a lookup table to get the mixed layer velocity using all that information. So that's the final step to get mixed layer velocity. And that's the last thing that we need to calculate the mixed layer heat budget. And what we're interested in here is not anything that we can calculate directly, but what we can infer from what these terms do not tell us, what the combination of these terms don't tell us. Um, so the mixed layer heat storage rate, uh, the mixed layer depth, we use a density criterion. Um, Actually, the mixed layer heat storage rate along with the temperature in the mixed layer, uh, the surface heat flux, we get these from the mooring using bulk formulas, and we use ERA instrument for things like long wave where we don't have it from the mooring. Um, vertical temperature, sorry, horizontal temperature advection, so we have the, ver the velocity in the mixed layer, and we use microwave SSD for the gradient of mixed layer temperature. So with all of these, so we can calculate them. Make a difference, and this gives us an estimate of the vertical turbulent cooling term in the heat budget. So that's the first method, this indirect method, to estimate uh, this term. And so this is an example of mixed layer heat budget daily data from one of the locations at, on the equator at 23 west, and the uh, shading in each plot are the error estimates for each term. So generally, uh, you can see big increases in the errors when we had to swap in um, another product when the more shortwave wasn't available, we had to use a replacement. And big errors in horizontal heat infection. This is the most uncertain term in the heat budget usually. It's the uh, horizontal infection. Okay, so now getting into some results for the residuals and estimating the cooling. So, uh, we've calculated all of the residuals at each of the mooring locations, and that's what this shows. The mean values are shown as the symbols and are separated into the trade winds, ICCZ, and equatorial regions. So on the equator, the, the green symbols is kind of what we'd expect. We see the strongest cooling along the equator, up to 100 watts per square meter in the annual mean. Uh, the, the, bar, the vertical bars indicate the seasonal range, so there are big seasonal ranges at almost every location. On the equator, it can be uh, close to 150 watts per square meter seasonal range. And even off the equator, the, the seasonal ranges are you know, at least 50 watts per square meter usually. Um, so the question is, what's driving, and the mean, the mean values off the equator can be, you know, 25 to 50 or more watts per square meter. So the question is what's driving these, this mean cooling off the equator if you trust these residuals. Um, and the error bars here are shown as uh, little symbols. So these are significantly different than zero counting for the errors. So what's driving this mean cooling um, and the strong seasonality of the cooling off the equator. And we picked these two, the 15 North, 38 West location, and 4 North 23 West. Okay, so the first thing you might think is that uh, maybe it's just the seasonal cycle of the wind, right? So if, if the 
if the winds are stronger during a certain season, they'll tend to mix the ocean more and you might get more cooling and that could drive the seasonal cycle of there's a mixing and cooling. But it turns out that it's actually the opposite. If you look at the relationship between the residual seasonal amplitude, so take, that's what's shown on the y-axis. So if you take the season with the maximum residual cooling minus when you have the minimum cooling, that's what's shown on the y-axis, and the x-axis is wind speed. Same thing, taking the wind speed when the residual cooling is strongest minus when uh, the residual cooling is weakest. Um, so what we find is that the strongest cooling um, actually happens for the weakest winds. So it's the opposite. You get, you get more cooling when the winds are weaker. So it can't be the seasonal cycle of winds that's driving the cooling. Um, so for the rest of my talk, I'll get into why we have these seasonal cycles, what, what drives them, and um, using the data from the moorings and some 1D models. So the main data that we use is from the Parada mooring. We use the daily enhanced Parada temperature and salinity, along with hourly meteorological measurements from the mooring. And then at 15 North 38, which I said, like I said before, we don't have direct measurements of the current, the vertical current shear. So we rely on a one-dimensional model to calculate the, the current. So this is the PWP model. Uh, we force it with the mooring surface data, the uh, surface heat fluxes, and the wind, and the uh, moisture flux. We do it for each month, um, initializing with the enhanced parameter temperature and salinity, and then force it uh, for that month, repeat it for each month, and do it for seven years. So we have seven years times 12 months gives us 84 monthly model run. From these, we have temperature, salinity at one meter vertical resolution, temperature, salinity, and velocity. We then feed these into the KCP mixing model uh, to, do, to calculate the vertical diffusivity. So that's how we do it at 15 north. So it's kind of an indirect, you know, we have to, we have to estimate the vertical structure of velocity and then feed it into a mixing model to calculate the mixing. Um, and so this shows some validation of, of this model, the PWP output. So the, the Parada temperature is shown here on the top left, and then from the model is shown below, and you can see pretty agreement generally uh, between the two. And then velocity, we have velocity measurements at 10 meters from this morning. So we compared them to the 10 meter velocity from the model, which is shown in red. And the model actually underestimates the variability of the velocity at 10 meters. It's pretty clear, the black line is the, the observed velocity. So what we've done is to adjust it, um, comparing the standard deviation from the model to that from the mooring velocity, and then scaling the model velocity up um, based on the difference in that standard deviation. So the green shows with that scaling, you get better, uh, more variability of the velocity in the model and it agrees better. Okay, so then on the right we show a comparison between the Parada, the actual measured 10 meter velocity from Parada, which peaked in September, <laughs> blue curve compared to the shear from the model at 35 meters in the red. So there's some agreement here and it's consistent that when you have stronger velocity at 10 meters, you tend to have stronger velocity shear at 35 meters in the model. Um, and the reason why we chose 35 meters is because we can also compare it to velocity shear from 80 to 50 measurements. And these were made during parodic cruises. The Brazilians make them routinely near 38, 38 west, 15 north. So the orange symbols show the shear estimated from these 80 cc, uh, lower 80 cc um, measurements near the morning. And there are large error bars on this because we don't have a lot of measurements, but we have generally decent agreement with the shear from the model of those lots of, lots of noise, like I said. So it gives us some confidence that this model is doing a decent job representing the temperature and the velocity at this location. At 423 West, I, um, it's, we have more data. Uh, we have velocity 
measured directly at the moorings. So we use this along with temperature from the moorings, salinity, velocity at 11 depths, um, and the standard meteorological measurements. We can give these all directly into the mixing model, the KPP model. We have the enhanced velocity measurements during one year. So we just take this year, this period, and force the model with everything. We don't rely on any anything to estimate the current, the current year. We have it directly from the morning. So this is a more direct way to calculate the mixing. All right. So last slide on the methods. Then, so we have the vertical diffusivity from the KPP model, and then we need to calculate the turbulent cooling at the base of the mixed layer. So that's the last step. And we need to know the mixed layer depth. So for consistency with, with the model output of the diffusivity, we calculate the mixed layer depth based on the diffusivity, uh, where it's 0 0.001 less than the value in the, um, out, sorry, the first step, where it's um, less than 0 0.001 for diffusivity. And it turns out that the mixed layer depth is not sensitive at all to this definition because there's such a sharp drop off in diffusivity below the mixed layer because um, stratification starts to increase. So it's not sensitive to that. And if we compare this to the mixed layer depth calculated from the more temperature and salinity using a density criterion that's shown in red at 15 north 38 west, and the blue is based on the diffusivity from the model. You can see at 15 north 38 west, where we don't have direct velocity measurements, there's uh, seasonal cycles reproduced well, but uh, the model underestimates. The mixed layer depth based on the diffusivity from the model is, is too shallow compared to uh, based on the mooring using density criterion. At 423 west, where we have direct velocity measurements and shear, the agreement is much better. Uh, the, the model is doing much better representing the mixed layer and you get a similar seasonal cycle. And I'll get back to this later and why how, the implications for um, calculating the mixing, estimating the mixing at, at this location, 15 north versus 4 north. Um, so the final thing is, so we have some diffusivity from the model and the mixed layer depth that we estimate. Then we just calculate the temperature gradient below the mixed layer, 10 meters below. Uh, multiply this by the diffusivity average between uh, the mixed layer depth and 10 meters below. And this gives us uh, the vertical turbulent cooling of the mixed layer. So I'll talk about 15 north 38 west first. Uh, the northernmost of red circle in the central basin, and this is where, you know, about 40 or 50 watts per square meter on average of cooling based on the residual. So I'll show, I mentioned that we, we ran the model for seven years, and I'll show 2012 as an example. It's a pretty representative year. Um, so again, this is using one-dimensional model forced by the uh, measurements from the morning to calculate the mixing, PWP and the KPP model. So this is the wind stress from the mooring on the top, and it has a weak seasonal cycle. The weakest winds tend to happen in the summer and fall. Uh, the, the second panel shows the current speed. This is from the PWP model. Remember, this is not directly measured. And what this shows is that you get stronger currents during the period when the wind is weaker, right? So the summer fall, you have weaker winds, shallower mixed layer, stronger current. And third panel, you can see the shallower mixed layer, warmer SSP during the summer and fall. As the winds get weaker, um, the diffusivity in the fourth panel, again, you can see the showing of the mixed layer in the summer and fall. So a uh, bottom panel shows the vertical turbulent cooling. And what happens is, uh, in the summer and fall, the winds are weaker, but you have a lot of variability. So when the winds get weak, close to zero, it warms up the surface and it shoals the mixed layer. You have a thin mixed layer. And then as soon as the winds increase, uh, it, it rapidly deepens the mixed layer. And this causes um, current shear. You're forcing currents near the surface. The shear generates mixing and rapidly cools. They have a burst of cooling. Uh, when this happens, and you can see this in the bottom panel, these episodic, these big cooling events up to 2,000 watts per square meter um, when you have these sharp increases in winds after a period of low wind. So that's what we think is happening um, at this location, which drives most of the mixing. It's, it's really these short time scale 
events um, that are driving a lot of it. And I'll zoom in. So this zooms in on August, October when we have these strong cooling periods. And you can see, I mean, the wind, wind decreases and the mixed layer shoals, you get warming. And then when the wind increases, you start to mix down the warmer water near the surface and cool from below. And these big spikes in the turbulent cooling. Um, there's one, the second event here, it actually seems to be driven also by a reduction in short wave radiation. So you're reducing the, uh, the buoyancy. buoyancy. It might be partially buoyancy force at the surface driving the mixing. Um, and again, a big one, the last one here, the wind is basically zero. Um, lots of warming near the surface and then increase the wind, get strong current, uh, inertial waves propagating downward. And it's really this burst of mixing here at the beginning. The inertial waves don't seem to play a big role. It's really this, this initial intense uh, directly wind forced mixing that's doing a lot of the cooling. Uh, okay, so I mentioned that there are that uh, we're using models, so this is indirect. We don't have direct velocity measurements, and that turns out to be a problem at this location um, because uh, we don't have the high frequency variability of currents. It's really it's only forced at the surface by the wind and the surface heat and buoyancy fluxes, and so this is why we're getting a big difference between the model and what the heat budget residual is telling us the vertical cooling should be. The model really underestimates the cooling. Um, and again, it's likely because we don't have the real uh, velocity that's going into the model to estimate the mixing. The high frequency shear is not there. And to show this more clearly, the bottom panel shows if you have, so the full model is in black. And then we do an experiment where we take out the diurnal cycle of everything, and that's in green. So that doesn't have much of an effect. The diurnal cycle doesn't seem to be playing a big role. If we remove all of the inertial energy uh, from the currents and temperature and salinity, that's the blue. And that also doesn't seem to have a big impact. So it's not these um, shorter frequency, you know, shorter time scale diurnal or inertial oscillations. So if we remove all of the velocity, just the velocity, set it to an annual mean, you know, only annual mean currents, then we get basically nothing. So it seems to be mostly these high frequency variations of shear uh, that are not related to the wind um, that's driving most of the mixing. Um, actually, sorry, <laughs> that's for the next, that's for the next location. At this location, um, it is, so we don't have the high frequency velocity. So in this case, um, we're underestimating the cooling, but from the model, it, it is mainly these episodic mixing events, which is which are driven by the wind. So at this location, this is 50 in north, 38 west. So it's yeah. So we're under underestimating the mixing, but what is estimated by the model is due to the direct wind forcing, and not due to due, not due to the diurnal cycle or very much to the inertial near inertial waves. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we use um, the inertial period is like two, two and a half days. So I think we just eliminated the event. Um, what did we do? I think it was a, a low pass filter at about four days, something like that. Because the model really doesn't have any variability. But on a shorter time scale than the inertial, because it's all forced by it's all wind force. All right, so that's at 15 north, 38 west. It's four north, so this is to the south in the ICCZ, and you saw um, about you know 40 watts per square meter in the annual mean of cooling here, and this is kind of. Uh, better, more exciting results, I think, because we have direct measurements of velocity and the shear, and so we get better agreement, which I'll show. Um, but it is consistent with what, what we got at the other mooring location. So uh, this is direct measurements from the mooring now, uh, temperature and mixed layer depth in the top, and then the velocity from the current meters that we have on the mooring. 
Um, so the, the SSP is highest in the spring, and then you have a, a deepening of the mixed layer and cooling of SSP in the summer. The velocity has a lot of structure to it. So this is the actual measurements now, not the model. So you can see a lot of shorter time scale variability of, of ocean velocity. And um, especially CIW activity, which appears in the spring and summer as the mixed layer thickens. Uh, so a lot of structure, especially in radional velocity on the bottom. Um, we had some gaps in the data, which we saw with interpolation. And there are also, uh, the, unfortunately, the, the current meter at 87 meters failed um, a few months in. So if the mixed layer, of course, if the mixed layer gets down to 87 meters or so, where we don't have these measurements of the shear, we can't estimate, we can't calculate mixing. So that would be the gap in the record uh, when the mixed layer is within 10 meters of the deepest velocity measurement. Um, all right, so with that data, we can, uh, so this is a zoom in now showing the April-May period. And I chose this period because it has some interesting structure in temperature and velocity. So the top shows a strong diurnal cycle of SSP that's captured by the mooring, and the mixed layer depth in black shows shoaling and deepening with the diurnal cycle. The middle and bottom show the velocity measured from the mooring, the hourly velocity measurements. And they show strong near inertial waves. So at this latitude, the inertial period is about seven days. So you can see these seven day oscillations in velocity, inertial waves, and there's a lot of variability on shorter time scales, less than a day actually, especially in the meridional velocity. You can see these really um, short, short time scale structure to the velocity. And we said this data, or so first, this one step closer to calculating the turbulent cooling. Um, so the stratification and the shear are ultimately what affects the mixing the most. So the top shows stratification, and it's strongest when the mixed layer is thinnest during the uh, during the spring and also in the winter, and weaker stratification during the summer and fall. The shear has a lot of structure to it, and it tends to be strongest when the mixed layer is thinnest during the spring into the summer and in the winter. Um, also leading into the spring you know, second half of the record. The shear is really weak during summer and fall when the mixed layer is thick. And this leads to high stability in the bottom panel, the Richardson number gets very high, the, the yellow values when the mixed layer is thick and the shear is low and higher, a lower Richardson number, stronger uh, instability and in mixing during the uh, winter and spring. All right, uh, so with these, we can, these are, um, so the data we put in, give to the one-dimensional mixing model, and this shows the diffusivity from the model, the bottom panel, the blue, is the vertical diffusivity from the model. And uh, this is driven by shear, the top panel, the blue shows the shear below the mixed layer, and the stratification, which is the black curve on the bottom. And What's happening is we have the strongest shear during the spring and also uh, in the winter when the mixed layer is thinnest, the black curve on top, mixed layer is thinnest, strongest shear. Uh, stratification is not too strong, not too weak. So it's weak enough that it can promote mixing um, instability, but it's not too weak so that you get actually get a lot of cooling when you have strong shear. So it's kind of a balance between, you know, stratification. Some, sometimes the stratification is weak enough to give high diffusivity, but not too weak, so that you get uh, mixing up with colder water when this mixing happens. So the strongest turbulent cooling happens in the spring, into the summer, and then when the mixed layer gets thick, the shear goes down. Diffusivity is basically zero. Stratification is strong. So all of these things are inhibiting turbulent cooling during the summer into the fall. The red, red curve on top shows you almost have almost zero turbulent cooling during summer and fall. So that seems to be what's happening for the seasonal cycle at this location. 
Um, and this is assumed in on a period with strong cooling in May and weak cooling in August on the right. And again, you can see the importance of shear. When you have strong shear, you tend to get the highest diffusivity and the strongest turbulent cooling on the bottom panel. And this happens despite similar values of the stratification, the uh, delta C, the blue curve on the top. So similar stratification, but yet when you have stronger shear, much stronger cooling. And um, so suggesting that shear is very important. It's not just the mean shear, but the variability of the shear, high frequency variations of the shear are important to drive this mixing. And you know, it basically gives you chances to produce mixing because if you have high shear and high diffusivity and your vertical temperature gradient is strong enough, um, you'll get strong cooling. And when you don't have this high shear, when you don't have these spikes of high shear, you know, you don't really have much opportunity to generate cooling um, no matter what the stratification is. All right, so finally, uh, we compared the seasonal cycle of cooling from the heat budget residual, which is shown on the right, the top panel in blue, is the seasonal heat budget residual across all years that we have from the morning, about uh, 12 years. And then the black is from the model forced by the data from the morning. And they agree pretty well in terms of seasonality. So, and I, this is in contrast with the other location I showed where there was a big offset between what was estimated by the model and what the heat budget residual showed. So this is consistent because at this location we actually have direct velocity measurements. We have the high frequency shear that seems to be driving a lot of this mixing and the seasonality. And we didn't have that uh, F15 North 38 mm -hmm. West. So it's consistent saying that you really need this high, high frequency shear periods less than a day seems to be most important for getting a lot of the cooling. Um, and at this location, near inertial waves actually are significant. The blue shows the model run without any inertial periods compared to black full model. So you get you know, up to 20 watts per square meter mixing of cooling due to the inertial waves at this location. But the main thing is that if you reduce the velocity variation less than a day, you get basically no seasonal cycle in the cooling. So it's really these high frequency shear, shear variability that's driving most of the mixing and the seasonal cycle. Um, all right, so we, we found that there are, so the first question was whether there is significant turbulent cooling off the equator and a seasonality to it. And we found that there is based on the heat budget residuals and then consistently the one dimensional models driven by the Parada uh, data tell us that the mixing is significant and there is a seasonal cycle off the equator. And surprisingly, the cooling tends to be weakest or tends to be strongest when the winds are weakest and the mixed layer is thin. And this seems to the thin mixed layer and um, high frequency shear seems to lead to a lot of the mixing. The shear is enhanced when the mixed layer is thin. For some reason, we don't know why, and this leads to stronger mixing when the winds are weak, very thin. Um, so the local wind and buoyancy force mixing, which includes inertial waves, we found was not too important, only at about 25% of the seasonal cycle of turbulent cooling at most. And of course, these are all are indirect. We don't we didn't show any uh, direct measurements of mixing for microstructure, things like that at, at these locations. So we need verification for more uh, direct measurements of mixing to back this up. Um, and it, this generates some questions. Uh, the main thing is uh, what's the source of this high frequency shear on periods less than a day? I don't think it's tides. Uh, it's in, we're in the open ocean, it's away from the coast. I don't think there's not a spectral peak in semi diurnal velocity shear, I don't think it's tied, so it could be uh, something, it has to be something remotely generated that's not correlated with the local winds at all. So uh, something like surface gravity waves, internal waves, something that's generated and it's propagating in to the location. Um, 
Another question, why, why is the shear strongest? Why is there seasonality to the shear if it's driven by some remote process, some waves or, you know, internal waves, something like that? Why is there seasonality? Um, it, it seems to be related to the mixed layer depth, so is the, the shear, the velocity, and the shear enhanced when the mixed layer is thinnest, which drives stronger shear? Uh, what causes that? And the other thing is, we can compare, we have these direct observations at least of the velocity and the shear, so we can start to compare to models and um, see if models reproduce the shear and um, the mixing that we infer from the heat budget residuals and the one-dimensional models. And that's all I have. Thank you.